All right, everyone. Um, let's get started. I think uh, some more people might join in later. Uh, but today I wanted to kind of go through and uh, explain what is hashing. I uh, wanted to introduce this concept of hashing and uh, uh, why do we actually build data structures using hashing and what kind of advantages does a hash table give over other data structures. Um, that, that was pretty much uh, the idea of, for this lecture. And I also wanted to cover a, a couple of uh, pro programming problems that could be used using a hash table. Um, they would they would end up being pretty simple problems, but still uh, uh, using the hash table makes it very very performant to uh, solve those problems, right? So let's get started. Um, so what exactly is hashing? So uh, essentially, one of the things that we've kind of looked in the past to some of the sessions is that uh, we can use uh, linked lists or trees for doing searches over uh, over a collection of objects. But the search uh, time complexity tends to be pretty low. So, for example, if you're using a linked list, the time complexity of search in a linked list would be of order of n, right? Because uh, given a linked list, you will probably have to look at all the elements that are present in the linked list to figure out where a particular element resides, right? Because inherently, there is no structural ordering to a linked list. In a, in a binary search tree or in a tree, you could get a better search time by essentially ensuring that objects are structured in a certain way. And what we saw in the last session was that the height of a uh, tree is of the order of log n, right? So at max, you have to go uh, log n steps to find any element in the tree. Right? Roughly, that's the kind of intuition. And so uh, the overall complexity in a tree tends to be much lower uh, than a linked list. But still, it is. But still, we can see that the time complexity is a function of n, right? So as you kind of increase the size of n, so let's say if you have a collection of a hundred, a million objects, right, or maybe a billion objects, your time complexity would still be pretty high. So we have a data structure um, which wherein the time complexity remains bounded and constant, and that is the idea behind hashing. So if you have a very large collection of objects and you want to quickly search. Right. For example, let's say you have elements in a file and you want to figure out where does a particular uh, character occur or where does a particular word occur. Uh, right. Uh, so then uh, something like a hash table is very much uh, very powerful. Um, it is also used in inverted indices for doing doc, uh, searches on documents. So when we are doing when we go to Google do document search um, in inherently, it's basically using a inverted hash table, which is a another kind of hash table to look up elements uh, in documents right so that, that's the idea and that's the pretty much the use case behind uh, why hashing is used now in this particular uh, lecture i wanted to kind of go through two major designs uh, in which hash tables are built so uh, hash tables can be designed in different ways as well and the two major internal designs that you need to know is essentially one is called external chaining uh, and the other is called uh, open addressing right so in this uh, uh, we first kind of go through i'll first introduce you to what exactly is external chaining so let's say you're given an input and input has four strings uh, which are a b c d e f m n o and x y z so these are the four strings that you want to keep in a hash table right so in an external chain uh, hash table there are two major concepts uh, of how the data is kind of structured the first is that there is an array of buckets in the hash table and the other is for each bucket there is a linked list of slots in the hash table so what are the buckets and what are the slots uh, right so eventually uh, let's say you are trying to input uh, or you are trying to uh, insert the string xyz into the hash table so what we do is we first try to figure out which bucket uh, does this xyz lie in so let's say it lies in bucket B1. And to do that, we use a specific function. We'll come to that later. But let's say it lies in bucket B1. So then what we do is we try to put insert this XYZ into B1. And we pick one of the slots that is associated with B1. So this, this slot will be a list of slots. Now, one of the uh, assumptions that is made is that this linked list of slots can have at maximum k elements in it, 
right? And that is the main like idea behind the external chaining that once you detect as to where an element lies, as to which of the buckets an element lies in, you just need to take at most k steps, right? And so your search complexity becomes the complexity of hashing, right? Finding the bucket plus figuring out in within this chain where does the element lie, right? So the complexity, uh, if you think about it, would be uh, the complexity of hashing, which is a constant time uh, compute method plus the time order of k, which is the time complexity of actually jumping from one linked list element to the other. So that remains constant. Now, I did talk about this concept called a hash function. So a hash function is essentially a function that given an input of any kind, given a string or an integer input, would essentially map to one of the buckets in the uh, table. So that is pretty much the idea behind a hash, uh, hash uh, table, uh, sorry, hash function in, of a hash table. So you can imagine something like if let's say the number of, uh, so let's say the size of um, the uh, hash table in the terms of the number of buckets is let's say this size is equal to M, which is the number of buckets, then a simple way to define a hash function for an integral value could be I mod of M, which will give a value that ranges between zero to M minus one, right? So that is one way to kind of define a hash function wherein you just take the integral input uh, and I'm just defining it for integer for strings as well. You can define it in a slightly different way, but um, the basic idea is to take the input and then to try to map it in the range of buckets that are available, right? Um, and uh, usually a modular function helps, and usually m tends to be uh, some something like uh, usually m tends to be of uh, some order of the size of the buckets. So it could be equal to the size of the buckets. That would be a simple way to define it. You, we can also define it in more complex ways. But but the conceptual idea is the same that um, you are able to take input and map it to one of the buckets. Now the other concept that is interesting in hash tables is that if let's say the size is a million objects, right? Then you can take a hash table which has million buckets and you can map everything one to one, but that would end up increasing the space complexity by a lot, right? So what ends up happening is that um, uh, we try to keep this size to let's say maybe a hundred thousand, which is a smaller uh, number. And then we try to keep this as probably a hundred. Right. So the idea is that the overall number of slots available would still be more than a million, but the number of buckets may, will be less. And the trouble with having less number of buckets is that you could have collisions, right? So it could happen that DEF and ABC may all may both map to B3 bucket. So to be able to handle this scenario of handling collisions, what ends up happening is that we have different slots, right? So we have slot one and slot two. And so each of the string will go into a different slot. So that is why a linked list is used. Otherwise, if every element was mapping uniquely to a bucket, we could have just kept uh, elements into the buckets itself, right? And the other uh, assumption or thing that I kind of walked over is that a priori, you cannot map the input to buckets, right? So essentially, this would be some function. And even if you had a million buckets, you might still end up getting collisions, right? Because you can't define a perfect hash function, which will um, uniquely map each input string to each bucket. So that is really not possible in a real world scenario because input tends to be very skewed and noisy. So what tends to happen is even with a lot of space, you have collisions. And so you have a way to avoid collisions. So in chaining, the way to avoid collisions is just to put elements in different linked lists. So this is, uh, what is called external chaining. Then there is this idea of open addressing, uh, which is another different design for a hash table. And this design is less common than uh, uh, external chaining. External chaining is the more common design. So let's uh, talk about this design. So in this, the major difference from external chaining is that in this, there is no set of chains. There is no set of uh, uh, linked list that is maintained. So that is not there. 
But what ends up happening is that you store elements in a bucket, but you handle collisions slightly differently. So, and the way the collisions are handled is also pretty interesting. The way it's done is that we introduce this concept of linear probing. Um, and essentially the concept is of probing. Uh, it could be uh, linear is just a, a, a way of probing. It could be like quadratic as well. So what happens in case of collisions? So let's say if you have strings ABC and DEF, which collide because they are both mapping to this B3 bucket, the string that comes in next, right? So in this di diagram, we've shown DEF to come in next, it gets mapped to a different location. And this different location is detected by a probing uh, function, which is basically saying that take the old, so the way it's basically done is that we have an offset, which is a predefined offset. So let's say this offset uh, for this particular hash table is two. So if you have a collision, you jump to buckets and then try to see if there is an available slot, right? And if there is an available slot, put the element there. If the available slot is not there, then you jump another two buckets and then try to figure out. And if, if that is there, it just ends up going in a loop. And after a few steps, it basically figures out that the hash table has already become full. So I have to do something else, right? So it kind of stops there. And we'll talk about what, what is done when the hash table starts to become a full. Uh, but the idea is pretty basic. The idea is that you jump to a location, you try to see whether the string exists. And if, uh, if, if already uh, the bucket is full, then you jump to a new location. And uh, in a linear probe, the, uh, the jumps are pretty linear. So they may be like constants or they may be a function of n, which is the number of elements. But in a quadratic probe, it could be n squared. So you may end up jumping uh, by, uh, it's basically proportionality to the number of elements. So I think that doesn't really uh, affect much. It has some uh, variations in the properties of the hash table, but in general, the idea is that you don't manage the external chains. You just manage an array uh, and you keep jumping as and when you find the hash table to kind of uh, have collisions. Now, another interesting concept that is used, uh, which is uh, used to figure out whether the hash table is full or not, is called a load factor. Uh, so the idea behind the load factor is to basically figure out whether the hash table that is currently built, is the hash table getting full or not, full or not, right? Is it getting filled or not? And is it time to start thinking about increasing the size of the hash table or doing something so that the collisions are reduced, right? So the idea is pretty simple. The load factor is the number of elements that are there in the input and um, the number of slots that are available in the hash table, right? So, so I think this, this N is uh, the number of elements from the input that are present in the hash table and M is the number of slots available. So let's look at this example. So for example, for this particular case, we have one, two, three and four elements that have been put into the hash table and we have five slots available. So essentially the load factor is uh, 0.8, which basically says that it's 80% filled up, right? If we go back to our old original here, right? In this, we have around eight slots, right? Available and we have four elements put there. So the load factor here is 50% uh, or 0.5, right? So basically what it says is that half of the hash table is filled and here it says that the hash table is kind of nearly filled up, right? And so when a hash table starts to get filled up, what ends up happening is that there's a step called rehashing that is done. And the idea behind uh, rehashing is, uh, is essentially that um, what, so essentially the way the hash table is designed is, is you would start with a small size of a hash table, right? Uh, so that you don't end up consuming a lot of memory. But as you start to see the hash table getting filled up, you basically rehash. And by rehashing, usually what is done is that um, the size of the hash table is changed and the function hash function is appropriately changed, right? So if let's say this was the initial uh, hash table, which had eight slots, right? After rehashing, uh, it would have 16 available slots, right? So basically it will just double and from eight, from four, this would become an array of eight elements. 
and because every a, a bucket had two slots, so the total number of slots would become 16. And so your load factor would go down from 0.5 to 0.25, right? So basically what ends up happening is that, uh, is that it, it eventually you start with a small size of the uh, hash table and you keep inserting elements. And when your load factor approaches uh, a threshold, it could be 60 or 70%, then what will end up happening is that the lookups will start to get slow. And why does the lookups become slow? Because your collisions will start to kind of increase. And so you need to rehash and reduce the load factor so that your uh, lookups become fast, right? So uh, even if you see in, in the case of open addressing, uh, what will happen is that if you want to look up DEF, you will have to jump two steps. So first you will have to jump to ABC, which is using the hash function. And then you will use the linear probe to find the appropriate place where DEF is. And so uh, you can see because of collisions, you have to take an extra step, which becomes an extra computation. And so the hash becomes, sorry, the search becomes slow. So another thing we didn't cover was that even for open addressing, the lookup time still remains constant. And so the way it's kind of done is that you could see that the, the hash function time remains constant. So you just compute the hash function, figure out the initial position where the input has to be. And then you need to take a few constant jumps, right? So the number of jumps are bounded so that you you don't have to take n number of jumps where n is the input. You probably have to take k number of jumps. And if the hash, uh, so if the hash table is still not able to find the element, then you rehash, right? So essentially, in both the designs, what is kept, what is ensured is that your um, lookup and inserts are of constant time. The constant time is also amortized, um, and and every time kind of the, uh, so that is the most important thing. And every time the hash table starts to get filled, you do a rehashing to ensure that the lookup times remain constant. So those are the like most important primary concepts that are used in hashing. Um, and every time, anytime, like if you are in an interview around data structures and somebody uses hashing, if you are able to decide, de define the, like the design, which is the external chaining design, or even the open addressing that gives, uh, the interviewer enough confidence that you know the internals of the data structure. Uh, so that was mostly around the concepts that I wanted to cover. Uh, um, there are a few, uh, there is uh, one more in, uh, concept that is usually covered in hashing, which is uh, just how do you write a good hash function, right? Um, and there are few properties that are used to write a good hash function. So one is uh, essentially uniformity. And this is more on the theory side. So essentially what uniformity says is that your input should be as uniformly distributed in the hash table as possible. And the idea is that the more uniform your input would be, the lesser would be the number of collisions and thereby the faster will be your search in both the designs. So the uniformity is really important. The other is that a, a good hash function should take all the input into consideration and nothing but the input. So, uh, and this is used for correctness, right? Uh, so let's say if, uh, if you have a string, which is ABC that you're using the hash function to map to a certain location, every time you give to that function, the string ABC, the output should always be B3 because let's say if you're using some pseudo random number generator in the hash function, it it may end up giving you B5, which may be incorrect, right? So just for correctness, the hash function should make use of the complete input and it should make use of just the input, right? So for correctness, I think just the input is more important um, and it should not make use of anything outside the input. Otherwise it, it, it can cause issues, right? So good hash functions are designed that way. Um, and the third interesting thing is that a good hash function should map um, similar strings and by similar meaning with very small delta uh, in very different ways. So what does it actually mean? So let's say if you have a string which is ABC and you have a string which is ABD, the buckets assigned to these 
uh, should not be very close by. So it should not happen that both of them are being assigned a bucket V1 or both of them are being assigned a bucket V1 and V2, like something like this. Maybe this is aligned V1 and this is V2. And th there's a very interesting reason behind this. So essentially in input distributions, usually what ends up happening is that inputs are usually skewed. So if you look at like just the names of humans, they very few names would begin with X, but maybe a lot of names may be big may begin with A, R, or S, right? So if you're creating a hash table of names of inputs, right? For example, let's say you're building a, dish, uh, a directory of phone numbers, right? So uh, if, if the property of similarity holds, then what will happen is that there'll be a lot of collisions in these names. And so you don't really want them because you want that uh, uh, search on these to be really, really fast, right? So. Uh, so this just how English language is constructed that or, or for that matter any other language is constructed that similar strings if they are given very very uh, non-unique uh, and dissimilar buckets then the hash function gives a better distribution on the hash table and so the hash table becomes performant. So as you can see even the hash function controls a lot of like properties of the hash table which is also pretty interesting uh, to know it's just not the design but also how you're writing the hash function, that's important. Uh, so those were a few things I wanted to cover uh, within the design of the hash function. Um, now, uh, if, if, if there are any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'll cover a couple of uh, programming problems that can be solved using hash tables. And usually asked in interviews as well. Okay, okay. I hope it was uh, clear. Um, so let's I'll just quickly jump to uh, this uh, couple of uh, problems that I had in mind uh, to cover. And uh, just, yeah. let's see. Okay. That's fine. So uh, let me just go ahead. So I, I, I hope you're able to see the terminal. Okay. okay, so essentially there are two problems that I wanted to cover. So one is this uh, problem of, uh, uh, which is essentially a compare array problem. So let's, and eventually the problem uh, here, I'll just quickly just write it down here so that way it might be better. And the problem is pretty simple, uh, but uh, it's kind of interesting and it's sometimes asked as well. So let's say if you're given two strings, so let's say you have a string which is A, B, C. Uh, so let's just say, let's just, sorry. so let's say this is A, B, C, D, and you're given a string another string which is a b right and you need to figure out whether the string s2 is a subset of string s1 or not right and a simple way could be that you take each element of s2 and figure out whether it exists in each element of s1 and so the time complexity there would be if this is m and this is size is n the time complexity would be m into n in the worst possible case because you'll have to take each element from this and compare with each element from this, right? But can we do something which is faster than this? So one way to do it is using a hash table wherein what you do is you keep each element in a unique position in the hash table. And when you're looking up elements from S2, you just see if this exists somewhere in the hash table or not. And if B exists somewhere in the hash table or not, and if both of them are yeses, then it's a subset. Right. Now, in this particular example, the overall complexity becomes O of, which is pretty much in the worst case, M plus N. Essentially, I'll try to explain why is that the case though. So in this particular case, you'll take two steps. So the first step is just build a hash table using all these elements. So there will be n inserts into the hash table. So the complexity will be O of n because for each insert, you just have to take one step. 
and to be able to look up you also have to take one step per element of s2 so you have to take m steps so the overall complexity from a multiplicative factor becomes a plus so let's say if both of them were had 10 raised to power 6 elements this would become 10 raised to power 12 however this would just remain 2 into 10 raised to power 6 which is pretty much saying that it's almost uh, 10 raised to power 6 times faster right so that's the like advantage of hash table we'll just quickly write down a program that actually does that uh, which will be interesting to see how a hash table could be used right so i'll end up just using a predefined uh, structure called an unordered map so this is using c++ c++ has ctls uh, sorry stls which are uh, predefined libraries and we can just directly use a hash table as a library there uh, so code will be pretty simple we'll just use uh, a couple of strings so let's say So, let's say this is S1, this is S2, so this is B, and S3. So, we'll do a positive and a negative case, and then you can say we'll write a method as well which detects this. So, you pass S1, S2, and Yeah, I don't know why Zoom doesn't. Uh, I think now you should be able to see it. Yeah, so basically, I was writing this code which is um, to detect whether a string is a subset of another string or not. Um, so I basically defined a. Uh, so essentially, I used an ordered map which is a predefined STL, which is a hash map. Uh, it's an imp non implementation of a hash map. We could even implement it, but that will take a little more time. Um, so the idea is that. And in general, while programming, you usually use these standard libraries. Uh, but what the idea is that you can do order one lookup. So that if that idea strikes you, then you should be able to implement it. So essentially, I'm taking a positive and a negative case when I'm taking S1, which uh, my name is Ravi and S2 is Ravi. So Ravi, so S2 will be a subset of S1, but S3, which is Ravi Tandon, will not be a subset of S1 because of course the string Tandon is not there in S1, right? Uh, so that's what I'll end up doing. And you'll see it's pretty easy actually to detect this uh, using uh, uh, using uh, hash maps. Uh, and the interesting thing is that uh, on very large collection of uh, objects is when you see the performance improvements. Um, so, so this string S1, then I write this string S2. And uh, so first I'll just create a hash map. Uh, so let's say the hash map is of character and then a bool right now. Element map. We can even use a hash set, uh, but I think I'm just going with a hash map and that should be okay. So the first, I'll just define two loops as we said, right? So the first loop will just say go over each element of S1. then insert it into the element map so this one idea so this is taking out the character and saying this character is this character is present um, so basically saying that the character at s1 at the index idx in s1 is present basically that's what it's saying and then what I'll do is I'll take another loop, go through each of the characters of uh, S2, right? Uh, S2 of size. And then basically say that if uh, if there exists a character, if there exists a character in S2 which is not present in S1, then I'll return false, which basically means that this. Uh, string is not a subset. So I'll write that condition, but uh, I'm just returning uh, false here. And if all the characters are found, then I'll return a true. 
saying that the string was actually a subset. So I'm basically writing the negative condition here and everything else becomes positive. So it's an easy way to kind of think about it. Now, how do you check, right? So one, so the way to check is there is this method called contains uh, or find, find in C++. So you can say that if uh, element map.find is two IDX is equal to equal to element map. So this is just the syntax of C++, a little string which says basically that if I'm trying to look for the character S2 uh, IDX, uh, so which exists at index IDX in S2, I'm trying to find it. And if, if this is equal to element map.n, which basically means that it wasn't found. So basically what C++ does is that it returns a um, uh, value, which is the end of the map. Then I'll basically say that I couldn't find at least one element from S2 in S1, thereby it's not a subset. So you can see it makes it very, very easy. And now we can try to just run this algorithm uh, right on S on these two conditions, S1 and S2 and S1 and S3. And we'll see one is a subset and the other is not a subset. So let's just try to first see this. Okay. Right. So essentially what this said was that the first comparison passed, which is true. And the second comparison didn't pass. So just look at it again. So in the first comparison, we said that is S2 a subset of S1? So Ravi is definitely a subset of S, S1, um, which is my name is Ravi. And is S3 a subset of S1? So Ravi Tandon is not a subset of S1. So it would have probably crashed at T. Um, because T is doesn't exist, right? So that's pretty much the idea. Um, makes it very, very simple uh, if you use STX, but eventually the concept is what you need to know, right? So that is one problem. I also wanted to go through one, another problem, which will also be pretty quick. Uh, so let's just, uh, yeah, let me just share the screen again. So the other problem is a little more interesting where sometimes it doesn't really strike that this is also a hash table problem. So what you're given is, let's assume that you're given an array of integers. Right. And I'll talk about what the intuition is uh, to actually think about it. It might help you out as well. So let's say you've given an integers uh, and you're given a sum. So let's say you've given a sum, which is, um, uh, let's say it is, yeah, 12. So 12 is a sum that you're given and you're given this integer input uh, of arrays, array of elements. And uh, what you're asked is that you're asked to figure out if in this input, there exists a pair, which is a couple of uh, elements, which has the sum equal to 12 or S. Right? Let's assume this is S, this is I. So this is the problem that you're given um, and the way you'll try to kind of initially solve is that you'll say, okay, let me consider all possible pairs. So let me consider one with two. Let me consider one with three. Let me consider then one with four and so on and so forth. So let me find out all n c2 pairs, right? Which is O of n square. This is n choose two. So n choose two is n n minus one by two. So it will become n squared uh, of the order. And you will basically try to see if the sum is equal to 12 or not, right? So that's one way. Um, but the interesting thing is that this problem can also be done in, in O n time. And uh, essentially the intuition behind this is that once you are given a element, let's say X, and you're given the element S, right? Then the so let's say you want to figure out a pair X and Y and you're already given X and you're also given S, then Y is essentially just a function of, right? Y is a function of X and S, right? Which is pretty much saying that S minus X should be the value of Y. So then it becomes just a search problem, right? So if you can basically look at a problem and then think of, of it as a search problem, you could use a hash table. So that's pretty much like, very, um, like a very coarse way of saying uh, what the intuition is, but 
if you are able to detect that then you can say that uh, i already know what the elements in the array are can i just search for element y and to figure out what the elements in an array are will just take me an amount of time and to search i already know it will just take me one step right and that is because of the power of hashing right so if that gets like strikes you uh, right during the course of an interview or uh, like when you're solving problems you will be able to write a very performant algorithm uh, so that's pretty much the core intuition and uh, as you see the idea would be just to make a hash table of all these elements and then look up why the hash table right if there was a question let me know i can answer um, and we are basically assuming that there are non unique elements so you can solve for uh, sorry we are assuming that there are unique elements so there are no duplicates you can also solve for duplicates with a little more work but let's assume for the sake of simplicity there are only unique elements so i'll also write down the algorithm for this so that way we'll get a little uh, more intuition of how to code for hash tables but it will be pretty sim similar so so we'll just go through it again so let's take the headers uh, right and then let's take an array so let's see if your array is right and let's say you have some this one is let's say this is 9 so 9 would be found and some 2 which is 12 and this would probably not be found right and uh, let's say just in this i'll also pass the size of the array the array itself the sum that you want to look at and size of the array array itself and the sum you want to look at and the here just write this and then yes here it will be size array and then so so first we'll just create this hash map in the hash table i'll keep uh, the element itself so whatever is the element uh, uh, so uh, the value of the element and i'll also keep the index and i'll come back to why i want to uh, keep the index here uh, so let's say we have this element map we will go through the first loop right and the first loop will just uh, loop through all the elements and idx is just for index loop through all the elements and then keep them in the element map uh, so the element map will uh, keep the number so let's say one and we'll keep the index position as well and then we'll go through each element again and this time we are just trying to search for what is the other element of the pair if such a sum could exist so what i'll do is i'll try to find what is the sum that is remaining and the remaining sum will be the initial sum minus the current value of the uh, array so let's say if you just look at one then the remaining sum would be if you passed in nine it should be eight so basically you are looking for eight so i'll then try to see if the remaining sum exists in the element map so the sum remaining if it exists so map so the way you find it is by saying if if the find method doesn't return end which basically means it exists 
just in tags of uh, how maps are implemented. Uh, then I will check one more condition, which is basically saying that I'll also try to ensure that if let's say the sum was uh, for this particular array, if let's say the sum was 10, I don't want to return five and five because there's only one five. So to be able to do that, I also ensure that the index I'm checking for is not equal to the index of the sum remaining. So essentially let's look at it. What we did here was that we're saying that the current index, which is the index of one of the elements, let's say that is five and the index of the sum remaining, which let's say if uh, the sum was 10, then the index would be five again. Oh, sorry, the sum remaining would be five. And in that case, both of the elements would have the same index, which is four. So we don't want to do that. But what we want to return is two unique kind of elements, right? Which are in different positions. So this is just saying that check the positions. Positions should be unequal. And if they are unequal, then just return two, which means that there has been an element which has been found. Uh, so, I mean, essentially it's as simple as this. You basically run two loops. In the first loop, you create the array. And in the second loop, right? In the first loop, we created this, uh, sorry, hash table. And in the second loop, uh, essentially, what we are saying is that you look up each element of the array and try to see if the sum remaining exists or not. And if the sum remaining exists, just ensure one more condition that the indices should not be the same. And that's why we kind of created an int to int map. So first int is the value and the second int is the index. Uh, so that's pretty much it, how this uh, problem has to be solved. Uh, and this is like an edge condition. So if you are just asked this question, the interviewer will not explicitly call this condition out. And you will have to kind of question that, are the elements unique? Can we consider the same element twice or not? Like those are some of the things that you have to ask the interviewer. If you don't, then like you might end up missing it in the code that you write. And so you might end up with bugs in the code. So let's check. So this is not right. So the warning said that I didn't return a false yet. Right. And we return a false because if we just couldn't find the pair, then that means the pair doesn't exist. And so we return a false. Right. Uh, if, if we return from here, this is the only place where we can return a true. If, if we never find in such an element, then like such a pair, then we return false. Right. So that's the idea. Uh, otherwise, yeah, it would have been a bug. So yeah, okay. let's just rewrite it. Right. So, just printing. So in the first case, I think we'll see that uh, the sum one exists because nine can be found from a pair, which is four and five, but sum two, which is 12 cannot be found right? because none of the two elements will form a sum of 12. We could have also returned four and five and require a little more work. We can just return a string of four and five. Uh, if we want to do that, we can really do that as well. So let's just say string plus This should also work. So let's see. So, so yeah, so for first we found for nine, four, and five exist and Otherwise it is a false, right? Because 12 doesn't exist. So that's pretty much uh, what concludes our uh, this uh, session on um, hashing. Um,